a real pleasure to welcome you here to the uh, first of the 2012-13 UW Computer Science and Engineering Distinguished Lectures. Uh, before I introduce Maria Clave, today's speaker, I want to uh, make sure you're aware of the two other distinguished lectures this fall. On Tuesday, October 30th here, so in a couple of weeks, Brad Smith, who's the general counsel of Microsoft, and he's going to talk on creating an environment for innovation. And then on November 13th, Susan Athey is going to speak. This one's a little out of the box. Susan is a superstar economist who's currently at Stanford, but previously has been at Harvard and MIT. And uh, she's going to talk on machine learning meets economics, using theory, data, and experiments to design market. Uh, Susan is also the chief economist for Microsoft, so looks at the interface between economics and digital goods. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, a longtime friend of mine, Maria Clave. Maria, as I said in a, a news release about this talk, is a triple threat. She's a leader in computer science, she's a leader in education nationally, and uh, she's a leader in broadening participation in the field. I first met her, God help us, 35 years ago. And she was, at that point, uh, transforming herself from a mathematician into a computer scientist at the University of Toronto. She spent eight years at Microsoft Research. She spent 15 years at UBC as CS department head, vice president for academic affairs, and then dean of science. Then she spent uh, four or five years at Princeton as dean of engineering. And most recently, for five or six years, she has been the president of Harvey Mudd College, as the uh, t-shirts say, the most amazing college you've never heard of. So Maria is going to talk to us today on the Harvey Mudd story from 10% to 40% female in computer science in three years. Please help me welcome Maria Clave. Um, so let me start by saying that UW is one of my favorite computer science departments on the face of the earth. Um, I have a few others. There's one at MUD, there's one at UBC, there's one at the University of Toronto. So I'm going to tell you what I think is a, a, a really interesting story, and I'm really proud of it, and I'm especially proud of it because I had nothing to do with it. And, and so it's really all about the absolutely incredible uh, group of faculty in computer science at Harvey Mudd College that decided that they were going to do something to increase the number of women majoring in computer science and uh, you know, they basically went from roughly 10% female, uh, which is where it had been for about five years, to uh, roughly 40% female at this point. It, it, um, this last year, 38% uh, of our graduating CS majors were female. Um, the year before that, 50% of our graduating CS majors were female. And it just sort of goes up and down. Uh, you know, we're a very small place, and I'll tell you more about that. And the, the, thing that, um, the thing that makes me so excited about this story is it's really possible to move the needle, to get the numbers to change. Um, I worked on it while I was uh, at the University of British Columbia for 14 and a half years. Um, and our numbers um, didn't go up as dramatically as, as they have at MUD. Uh, and I'll explain some of the differences, but they did go from being roughly about 15% female to about 25% female in the undergraduate majors program over six years. And um, I know that um, here at the University of Washington, you're about 25% female um, at both the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, you've got a ways to go in terms of getting to 25% female in your faculty, and I know that's something you're gonna work hard on this year. Okay. Um, Let's talk about why there are so few females in computer science. We actually really know the reasons. This is, there's been research done on this for at least the past 20 years. I did some of it, and my team did some of it. But um, there has been research done as recently as just two years ago. And uh, the reasons haven't changed in, in 20 years. Uh, the first reason is that uh, young women um, think that computer science is less interesting than other disciplines. They think they will not do as well in computer science as in other areas. And we encourage our young people, and this is not true in some other countries, but it is very true in the United States and in Canada. We tell people, do what you're good at, do what you're passionate at, and you will be successful and happy. Raise your hand if you have heard somebody say that. Yeah. It is our culture. And so if, if it is the case that young women entering college, 
um, think that computer science is not something they're interested in and it's not something they'll do well in, why would they choose to major in this area? Now, it's also the case that um, women uh, both uh, studying computer science and engineering and also working in tech careers are more likely to leave, uh, they're twice as likely to leave these careers and these programs as white males are. And uh, we also know there's been a lot of research on why that happens. And it's, it's really due to two things. The first one is they, uh, they are more likely to suffer from the imposter syndrome. So let's suppose they have been getting A's in most of their classes and for the first time they get a B or a B minus on an exam. That Whereas the guy next to them has gotten C, 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 and the guy next to them is going, I rock. <laughs> I'm doing really well. I'm going to get a great job in the software industry. And the female has gotten the first B and is going, I knew I wasn't really good at this. I knew I didn't belong here. I understand I should go do something that I'm actually good at, like economics or English or political science or whatever. Um, but it's also the case that if you are, let's say, 10% or 15% of the population, which is what I heard is the case in electrical engineering uh, here at the University of Washington, um, it really often feels like you don't belong. You perhaps are the only female in a class or one of two females in a class. And I, it just, it feels like the way the whole system is set up and the way it runs is really all about males and you know, all the things that might happen to you as a female, so for instance, you burst into tears when you get angry instead of, you know, slamming your fist into the wall. Um, it just does not feel like you belong. So, you know, it's pretty easy to solve this problem. I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, first of all, you have to find a way for women to uh, have an experience with computer science where they enjoy it and they actually do well at it, and they feel like they do well at it, that will get them to do more of it. And you also need to do things that will help them feel like they belong in this environment. Now, I can tell you, when you're up at 40% female, it feels like you belong in that environment. It really does. So here is the story. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Harvey Mudd College. Um, raise your hand if you had not heard of Harvey Mudd before you saw this talk advertised. Oh, only three hands. Hey, Mudders, we are, we are making real progress. Okay, it's an undergraduate college. Um, we have roughly 750 students. We have at this point about 90 faculty in seven departments, uh, six of which are in science and engineering and one of which is humanities, social sciences, and the arts all together in one department. Our majors are in science and engineering. Um, you can actually do an off-campus major. Uh, we're one of the five undergraduate colleges in Claremont, and um, you can actually decide to say to um, your major in dance, but you have to do a minor in one of the science and engineering areas at MUD. And we typically have, every year we graduate, maybe two or three or four off people who did off-campus majors. Um, we have a broad and deep core curriculum for the first three semesters that, um, so every student is taking pretty much the same courses for the first three semesters. And it's a whole bunch of math, a whole bunch of physics, a bunch of chemistry, one semester of computer science, one semester of biology, one semester of engineering, and a bunch of humanities, social sciences, and the arts. And uh, the thing that makes us really, that makes it easier to solve this problem quickly at MUD is that every single student has to take a computer science course in their first semester. Now, this has been true for a long time. I mean, it's been true uh, probably since at least 1990, probably earlier than that. And so even though this was the case, it was not the case that uh, we were managing to help all of our female students and male students love their computer science course in the first semester. In fact, um, before the changes were made that I'm going to tell you about, it was the most despised required course in the first semester, except for 
the people, mostly young men, who had been programming for a long time. Okay, so here's how it happened. I'm going to talk first of all about the student population overall at Harvey Mudd, and then I'll talk about computer science. So in 1997, which was when my predecessor, John Strauss, started as president, um, it was 22% female. Um, by the time he worked really hard on this, he did a great job, and I'm really glad he did because I'm the first female president, and it would have been, thank you, I'm the first female in my job for the last um, 25 years. Uh, um, he worked really hard on it, and that was very helpful for me because when you're the first female, People are sort of, they're suspicious of you. And they're watching, you know, what are you going to do to change this place? And for the most part, uh, in most institutions, especially very successful ones, they really don't want you to change much. And, um, and so anyway, he worked on it. It was just over 30% uh, in 2006 when I arrived. And right now, it's about 45% female. And our entering class this year was 47.5% female, which is not the highest it was been. In 2010, it was 51.5% female. We discovered that that was a bad idea because people were so shocked that we were over 50% female. They said, you must have lowered the standards. It cannot be true that, you know, the reality is we've been, for the last few years, we've been uh, admitting roughly 50-50. And uh, whether it's 51% or 47.5% or even 42%, 43% depends just on the yield. We're working with small numbers, and so you know, five more female students actually makes a difference. OK, let me talk about female faculty. Um, it's actually the story for female faculty is way more impressive than the story for female students. MIT has been at roughly 45 to 47% female uh, undergraduate student population for I think since about the mid-90s, certainly since the late 90s. Um, but they're only 15, 1-5% female uh, in their faculty. So it was about 20% in 1997 uh, when John Strauss arrived. He had gotten it up to uh, close to 35% in 2006. And by 2010, it was 42%. Um, now, you might ask, you know, how do you do that? Well, one of the, the truths about it is that there is only one pace, place on the face of the earth, as far as I know, that you can teach the quality of students at Harvey Mudd College and be more valued for your teaching than for your research. I mean, you can teach this quality of student at Caltech or MIT, though I will tell you that Mudd students are very different from MIT and Caltech students. They're, yeah, yeah, they are nicer, they're harder working, um, <laughs> they have more fun. Raise your hand if you're a MUD alum here. We have a few of them here. Yes. Well, Scripps is great too, and they love to hang out at West Dorm. And, and, and we like the Scripsies, but you know. It's, yes, exactly. Um, uh, we're the only place where you can actually teach this kind of student and be really valued for innovation and excellence in teaching. And, let me tell you, I often talk about some of our faculty members, you know, I'll be talking about some particular person, say Zach Dodds, or Daryl Young, or Christine Alvarado, or Nancy Lape, or whatever. And, um, and I'll be telling somebody about, you know, just how amazing they are and what they do, and then I'll say, but they're just average at mud. <laughs> okay, so what did our computer science department do? They did a small number of things over a period of about four years. First of all, they changed the intro course, and I'll tell you how. They eliminated student macho behavior, so let me explain what student macho behavior is. Um, you're in a computer science class, and, and you're already male or female. You're feeling a little nervous because you didn't have a lot of computer science in high school. And there, is, there are a couple of the students who are in that class with you who have been passionate about programming in computer science since they were, you know, some early age, so it could be eight years old, could be 13. But, you know, they have been just waiting to meet a real computer scientist their entire life. And I can tell you most high school teachers are not, who are teaching computer science are not real computer scientists. And so they finally get in this room, and there's Ed Lazowska. 
and they're going like, wow, a real computer scientist. And they just cannot stop talking to Ed Lazowska about everything they've been wanting to talk to a computer science, a scientist about for like 10 years. And so what happens is they're doing this in the class, and all the other students in the class are going, oh my god, I'm never going to pass this course. I mean, there are people in this class who know almost as much as the prof. I mean, this is just really, really scary. And you know, the thing about the students who are doing this, they're not doing it because they want to intimidate other students. They're not doing it because they're bad people. They're doing it because they love computer science and they finally met a real live computer scientist. Um, and so I'll talk about how they did this. They also decided, you know, it'd be really cool um, if our incoming female students could go to the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, which currently has about 3,000 uh, attendees, of which, you know, I don't know, 45, 70 are men. And, and all the rest are these incredibly enthusiastic, passionate, excited, happy females in tech careers or studying technology. And this was Christine Alvarado's idea. And she just thought, you know, hey, it doesn't matter whether you're going to major in physics or chemistry, biology, engineering, computer science, math. You're going to benefit for, from having this experience. You're going to benefit from seeing that there are lots of happy, excited, successful technical women of all ages um, that exist in this world. And then the final thing they did was, for four years, they provided summer research experiences for about eight to 10 females between their first and second year. OK. So let me talk about the intro course. The old course was a very standard introduction to computer science that was learning to program in Java. Um, and I'm realizing, uh, so Meg, Meg's back there. You were in the first year of, the new, of CS5, right? That's what I thought. And you graduated in 2010? OK. So Adrian, when did you graduate? 2009? So you were in the old course. OK. Um, so the new course is uh, it's computational approaches to problem solving using Python. They do just as much programming. They learn the same concepts. They do more teamwork than they did before. But the whole idea is instead of learning to program for the sake of learning to program, you're learning to program to solve a problem. And one of the things there's lots of research on is that women and also underrepresented minorities are more likely to be interested in computer science if they can learn what they can do with it instead of just learning about operating systems or about variables or about while loops or whatever. So they also, um, in order to um, eliminate this, to create a greater sense of belonging and, and less intimidation, they grouped by prior experience. Now, um, uh, stand up for a second, Lillian. OK, as, thank you. As you can see, uh, our colors are black and gold. OK, thank you. Um, and so they called the two sections of the intro course, which is called CS5, CS5 Gold and CS5 Black. OK, CS5 Gold is for virtually no prior programming experience. CS5 Black is for a significant amount of programming experience. And then what they were doing with the people who were coming in with the equivalent of you know, a, a semester or a full year of college computer science, they were putting them into the next course in the series, which is CS60. And eventually, they stopped doing that because of the match of behavior, which I'll explain in a moment. And they put them all in their own group, which is called CS42, which is, OK, you've got to pick a number between 5 and 60, because it means you're going to cover both. What number would you pick in the universe? You'd pick 42. Um, and um, even though CS5 Gold and CS5 Black start at quite different places in terms of the prior pro programming experience, they are at the same level by the end of one semester. Okay. Um, so how did they get rid of natural behavior? Uh, Ed, would you come up here for a moment? Now, Ed, Ed is my student. 
it's totally unrehearsed. I want yeah, to it's that. absolutely. And you know, Ed has been talking a lot in class. He's been answering every question. And, and when he, I mean, he does talk a lot, right? You know? <laughs> and, and, and you know, like, I, so Ed, um, we're one-on-one, -on -one, we're outside of class, and I say, Ed, I'm so glad to have you in my course. I've hardly ever taught a student with such a great background, and you're so excited about it. I'm sure you didn't mean to do this, but when you're so knowledgeable, it really scares the other students in the class. So if we could just talk during office hours or just one-on-one, -on -one, that would be fabulous. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> it works because Ed didn't mean to be a jerk. I mean, he was just super enthusiastic. And, and I, it's embarrassing to say, but you know, I give this talk at a lot of computer science departments, and I've had several male faculty members come up afterwards and said, that was me. I had no idea. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just in, well, it's just the way it is. But you know, the wonderful thing is, if you do this to every student in their first semester, I mean, they don't want to be intimidating. They just want to talk about computer science. And you give them other opportunities to talk about computer science, it just goes away. And um, you know, it doesn't hurt that MUD is an extraordinarily collaborative community where every student feels that it's their responsible, responsibility to help every other student learn and succeed, where there is no competition for grades. Um, it's bad behavior to ever brag about your grades. In, um, and that's partly because our grades are horrible. In s roughly 6,500 alumni, we've had seven graduate with a 4.0 average. Um, we give out, I mean, you guys should think about this when you're admitting people to grad school. Somebody who has a 3.1 GPA is a very good student. Somebody who has a 3.4 or 3.5 GPA is extraordinary. And then there are a few, uh, just people who I, I just don't understand how they do it who have you know, 3.7 or 3.8. At least one of them is in the room today. Um, so what happened when they did this? In that single first year, it went from being the most despised course to being the most favorite course in the first semester. In one year. Now, there's something else that was happening at the same time, and that's that the four people who chose to work on developing this course, so Ron Libeskind, Hadass, Prof. Ron, as he's known, um, Christine Alvarado, Prof. Alvarado, uh, Zach Dodds, Prof. Dodds, and Prof. Cunning, Jeff Kenning, These were, those are some of the four really best, we only have 10 faculty in our computer science department, but you know, they were probably four of the really very best teachers, and they took on teaching the intro class. And so, and, and before, nobody wanted to teach it because students hated it. And nobody likes to teach a course that people hate. And so it became this incredible course. I mean, I talk about the fact that we went to 10, from 10 to 40% female, but we actually went from like two female students graduating a year to Meg's year where we had five. That was like, oh yes! We now graduate 20 females, CS majors a year. I mean, it's just, it's been spectacular. And not only did it you know, recruit more majors, both male and female, um, it also you know, recruited more non-majors and higher level CS classes because now CS5 wasn't intimidating. They loved it, so they took CS60 and then they took CS70. So I should also tell you something about uh, getting women to be CS majors, at, at least at MUD. We don't tell them when they go to the Hopper course or when they're in CS5, we don't say, you should be a CS major. We say, you should take CS60 because you loved CS5 and you totally rocked in CS5. And CS60, it'll be a great experience and plus it will help you get a great summer job. Then we tell them to take CS70, which is the next one. You know, you'll get an even better summer job next year after you take CS70. So they take CS70 and then they've taken the first three courses and CS70, it's known among our students as boot camp for CS. Uh, it's a tough course. It's such a tough course that we have a gruder, which is a grader and tutor. It's, that's not only a mud word. A gruder for every two students in CS70. So, so, so we end up having like an eighth of the total student body at mud being gruders for CS70. 
but it's because it's where our students really, really learn to program well. It's where they learn, they will never ever be afraid of programming anything, anywhere, anytime, any place, in any language. Okay, um, and then after they've done CS70, they're sort of going, well, I'm doing pretty well. Um, I was thinking I was gonna major, was it chemistry, Lillian? Engineering. Well, for some people it's chemistry, some people it's biology, some people it's physics, but they sort of go like, well, I guess I, I could be, I could major in this, and there's a whole bunch of other females majoring in it. It's not that scary. Okay, taking first year females to Hopper. This was Christine Alvarado's idea. Christine arrived um, as uh, a, an assistant professor in 2005, one year before I did. Um, she had done her PhD at MIT and her undergrad, I believe, at Dartmouth. She's had a great experience as an, as an undergrad, and then she went to MIT and had really a pretty crappy experience. It was the first time that she had students and faculty saying to her, you're only here because you're female, you're not any good, you know, you wouldn't be here if you weren't female. Which is not, I mean, it does still happen today, um, unfortunately, at some places. Uh, so she decided that she would extend an invitation to all incoming female first year students in the summer and offer them the opportunity of um, an all expense paid trip, all expense paid trip to the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. It's an annual conference, it uh, moves around, it was just in Baltimore and last year, Atlanta, I think? Portland, Portland and the year before in Atlanta, et cetera. And um, uh, we do it during the summer because um, we know they can't actually miss physics labs and chemistry labs and so on. So we schedule them in the lab so that they will uh, not, on, on the non-hopper days, so they won't miss it. And we think that the experience is highly valuable independent of whatever they plan to major in. It's the easiest thing in the world to fundraise for. You would be amazed how many companies and individuals will give you money um, in order to get more females into computer science. Christina Alvarado has done a number of um, surveys of students and she's found that the impact of attending Hopper is inspiration, uh, finding, seeing that there's a critical mass of, of women in the field and like feeling that it's more interesting, awareness of job opportunities because every country, company and their dog goes to recruit at Hopper because that's where you can get all the female students and also just being exposed to role models in women in tech careers of all ages. By far the hardest time for students to get a great summer research experience is after their first year, between you know, their, their first year and their sophomore year. You know, it's really true that for bright students, they can do real research after their first year. I mean, I know this because um, while I was at the University of British Columbia, I used to typically hire co-op students um, for eight months starting in January. Um, I'm looking at Steve, but um, he actually didn't work with me until I guess a summer later. Um, and I, I just want you to know that Steve Gribble, apparently he's okay as a faculty member. That was all me. I did that. It's highly motivating for students. We know there's lots of research that shows that if you get uh, underrepresented groups, including women, engaged in research early in their undergraduate um, experience, that they're more likely to persist in the major. It builds confidence and a sense of belonging. And of course, it helps them establish a close relationship with a faculty member and their research group.
Of course, by the time we get to this point, you know, like many people are thinking, uh, including probably some of you, um, yeah, but okay, my, they have this opportunity that all of every student can has to take CS class, so they can teach if they teach a great intro class, they can hook all of these students into computer science, and um, at at you know my university, uh, say the University of British Columbia. Um, not all science students have to take a computer science course. Then all the engineering students have to take a computer science course. But engineering wanted it taught in Fortran, and you know wanted all kinds of things that you pr would probably not make it terribly attractive to female students. Um, wherever you are, no matter what kind of institution you are, um, you can make your intro courses the most fun ever. I mean, there's just no excuse for introductory computer science not being fun. And I mean, the reason, I mean, the reason it's fun at MUD is, is not just that, um, it's not, not just that they you know, have this computational, that they framed it as problem solving using computational approaches rather than programming. It's that they also try to give students choice about, you, so for homework assignment number three, there might be, you could do it either with an application biology or with an application with robotics. You're going to learn exactly the same material, whichever one, but it looks like you got a choice. And you know, one of the things that turns out is that students like having choices. Um, we also encourage a lot of collaboration we, uh, we run actual computer labs that we don't require students to attend, but almost everybody does, because it's so much more fun to be there and being, getting, getting help from people. There's just no reason, uh, no matter where you are, for not having a computer science course that is accessible and fun. And, and yes, it's really challenging. It's not easier than it used to be. It was not dumbed down, but it is way more fun. Second thing is it's pretty easy to eliminate macho behavior. I mean, you might say, well, I'm teaching a class with 300 students in it. But you probably have a bunch of TAs. And you, your TI, TAs can do exactly the same thing with students in their sections. And you know, the truth is, yes, there are a few jerks in the world. But almost all of the people who occasionally come across as jerks are not actually jerks. They don't want to be jerks. They just are clueless. And, and given a really nice, friendly opportunity to change what they're doing, they change what they're doing. We can all help students build confidence for the students who are actually there. We can have them work on team projects. We can have them do their assignments in labs. I mean, I will tell you, being a female who, um, this is not me, I'm talking actually about somebody called Pooja Sankar, who is the co-founder, who is the founder of Piazza, and who is one of the people who um, came up with the idea for the Women in Tech Share Online mentor, on, massive open online mentoring project that is going on right now. Um, Pooja was very shy. She grew up in India. Um, she went to IIT Kanpur. She was one of, it's either two or three CS majors in her year. And um, she was very uncomfortable around young men uh, because that's how she was raised. And, and so uh, all the guys were studying together in groups, and she was always studying on her own. And she felt it was incredibly intimidating and hard to learn things by herself. And so making sure that you actually provide students with opportunities to work in groups, uh, it is so much easier to learn in a group. And so making sure that you provide those opportunities is really important. And then, most of all, encouraging. I mean, I cannot tell you how much difference it makes for somebody, for particularly a faculty member, but also a graduate student or another student, to say to a student who is wondering, uh, so Anna, Anna and I were having coffee this morning, and we were talking about, you know, she was talking about how she really doubts how successful she is. And I said, Anna, I get up every morning feeling like a total failure. I also, I said this at lunch as well, uh, when I was meeting with a, a number of, of female graduate students and female faculty, um, I also get up every morning with this concurrent thought in my head that I can change the world. And, and I live with those two parts of myself day in, day out, and I will always live with the part of me that feels I am a total failure no matter what I do. Um, but 
I know that I can walk up to Anna and I can tell Anna and I can make her feel better about herself. You know, you're capable of doing pretty much anything you want with your life. You are extraordinary. And I, I actually mean it when I say it to Anna. <laughs> um, no, I mean it when I say it to other people as well. <laughs> and, um, but it's just amazing how much difference it makes. I mean, it's just having one person articulate this and in, in, in just say, you know, I know you are going to do well in your career. I know that you can graduate in computer science even though you're having trouble with CS70 right now. I know that you are going to get a great job after you finish your PhD, and on and on and on. So encouragement. Everybody can do it. It doesn't have to be f female. You can encourage people older than you. You can encourage people more senior than you. I'll just I'll tell a, a brief Lillian story. I could, I could tell stories about Eric and about Stuart. And, well, I, we know our students at MUD. But anyhow, I'm having a bad day. It's, and it's the day of the holiday party. And Lillian wanted me to come and, is this like last year? No, maybe it's, yeah. No, it's not your freshman year. No, you were already at least a sophomore. This is the story about the, yeah. OK, so she says, I want you to come and look at, there's a, an exhibit of, from my digital photography class. And can you come to the reception to look at it? And I said, no, I'm the host of this party. I have to stay here. And, and then, but I was really feeling down. There was all, all kinds of things had gone wrong. And, and, you know. and so when she came by again, said she was leaving for it, I said, OK, I'm going to at least walk you there. And um, so we're walking down the, the pathway. And um, I see a student who, uh, who's a first year student who I know has financial aid issues and who's thinking he's not going to come back for the second semester because of these issues. And we were working on trying to get them fixed. And I, and I, and I say, um, Andy, did we manage to get them fixed yet? And he said, no. And I go, ugh. Oh. And I walk down a little bit further. And, and we get to the, the door where Lillian's going to go into the reception. She, she looks at me and she says, you know, President Clave, I think you really need a hug right now. And she just wraps her arms around me. And then a couple of other students go, group hug, group hug. <laughs> and they come and they hug me as well. And I just cannot tell you what that meant to me that particular day. So you know, your opportunity to encourage people is not limited to the people that you teach or to the people that you mentor or anything else. You can encourage people who are a lot older than you are. Um, you can all take female students to Hopper. We took 58 students to the Hopper conference in Baltimore from Claremont, California. Uh, we had the most students at Baltimore. We also had the most students in Portland. And we had the second most in, in Atlanta, Georgia Tech beat us. And we had the second most at Tucson. Uh, I think it was Arizona State or the University of Arizona that beat us. Those are all slightly bigger institutions. Um, uh, but you know, one of my uh, former students, Corey Inkpen, who's a, now a, a researcher at Microsoft Research, um, a few years ago, she had this idea, let's have an imposter panel at Hopper. OK, so the idea is, OK, raise your hand if you have not heard about the imposter syndrome. OK, the imposter syndrome is just, um, it's just the feeling you have that everyone else thinks you're really successful. Anne and I suffer from this big time. Uh, and, and yet, deep in your heart, you just don't think you're that successful, and you just feel like you know, you're going through the motions, and, and yeah, good things seems to be happening, but you know, you feel like a failure. And, um, and so Corey's idea was let's have five women that everyone thinks of as being successful at different stages in their career, and they'll each talk about how, what makes them feel like an imposter and how they cope with it. And it was the most popular session at, at um, Hopper. And the thing is, it's totally trivial to organize. Anybody can do it. You just pick. Five females <laughs> who look successful, and they'll do. Um, uh, offer female summer research experiences. Um, one of the things that worked incredibly well at uh, University of British Columbia, which was um, recruiting uh, students into double majors programs. So one of the things that happens in almost every faculty of science, college of science, is that there's a ton of students, both male and female, but lots of females majoring in biology and chemistry or biochemistry or something, and they all think they're going to med school. 
And believe me, only a tiny fraction will go to med school. And the vast majority of them are going to graduate and be really annoyed because there aren't good job opportunities for biology or chemistry majors unless you get a PhD. And, and even then, it's not nearly like computer science. So you can have the instructors in those intro courses talk about the fact that they would be more likely to get into med school and more likely to get jobs if they did a minor or a double major in computer science. And it really works. And so UBC, um, they, they're double, in their double majors, they're 33% um, female. And in their biology computer science double major, they're 40% female. And it has really helped. In their, just their single CS major, they're about 22% female. Um, the other thing that worked like a charm at UBC was um, when I was dean of science, I couldn't possibly get the faculty of science to agree to make computer science a required course. So every place has some kind of you know, instructions for incoming first year students. And we just put in our, our instructions. We recommend that every student independent of planned major take a computer science course as you will find it helpful for any areas of science. Well, guess what happens? Females read and they follow advice. <laughs> so we went from having roughly 24% uh, female in our intro CS class to 38% female intro CS class in one year, just with that sentence. So it's great that you, at the same time, you also increase the female um, enrollment at your college in general. Uh, but if, if you hadn't, would drawing more people to computer science upset the gender ratio in other departments, in your opinion? That's a great question. And um, at the time that I arrived, when the percentage of, of females was, was about um, uh, you know, low 30% uh, in terms of students. It was about 27 to 29% female in engineering. It was over 20% female in physics. And, um, and, you know, probably close to 50-50 in math, chemistry, and biology. So I don't, I think that people could already see that CS was such an anomaly that trying to balance things out that people would not have, have really challenged that. And you know, when we first started taking students to Hopper, there was a little bit of, well, aren't you going to like, siphon all of them into computer science? But in reality, you know, lots of students who go to Hopper or go into engineering or physics or chemistry, it's just a really fun trip. It's very inspirational for all of them. And you know, I think that once faculty from other departments could see that that was the outcome, um, they were much more comfortable with the idea. Uh, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts uh, about the other end of the pipeline, that is the K-12, uh, which I understand is also a significant issue uh, in, for technical females, you know, entering sort of STEM fields and so forth. Yeah, so I, I think the, the, the important thing to recognize is that there are more than enough undergraduate women in, uh, bio, in the life sciences, in chemistry, um, and we do not need more young women to go into those fields. We, we just don't, uh, because there's not, enough, there's not enough jobs that really take advantage of that knowledge. And, and, and it's just torqued because of the, the medicine issue. Um, so the areas where we, and even if you look in engineering, uh, biomedical engineering, bioengineering is 50% female. Um, chemical engineering is 40% female. Civil engineering, or even 44% female, something like that. Um, civil engineering is mid-30s to, to 40 percent. Um, the places where we need those women, we need them in computer science, we need them in electrical engineering, we need them in aerospace engineering, we need them in mechanical engineering, we, et cetera. So, um, so, so that's the first thing is, you know, people talk a lot about there not being enough women in STEM fields. And I was invited to a White House forum on women in the economy. And you know, Valerie Jarrett was talking about this, and I just went up to her and I said, Valerie, you've got it wrong. We need more women in computer science and engineering, not in STEM fields. That's just the wrong message. And she argued with me, and I argued back. And then you know, the president came in to address us. 
And I was so happy because when he said, we need more women, women in STEM fields, he said, especially in computer science and engineering where they're really needed. And I was going, yay! And I went and thanked her afterwards. She said, well, I needed to make sure I got it into a speech. <laughs> um, OK, so um, K to 12. Uh, if you look at uh, performance in you know, APs and SATs and so on, there's very little difference uh, these days except in physics and computer science. Um, you know, girls are doing extremely well in mathematics, in, in chemistry and biology. They are less likely, uh, they're typically about, I think, 18% of, or, or maybe 20% of the AP physics takers. Um, they're quite a bit lower than that in terms of the AP computer science takers. I think it's very hard to fix K to 12 because it is so influenced by popular culture. And, and you know, so what does a computer science look, scientist look like? It looks like Bill Gates. Bill Gates is not bad looking, but his social skills are lacking. <laughs> or they look like Dilbert. Dilbert doesn't even look good. Um, some of you who are old enough will remember watching Friends at some point, and there was a character called Chandler. Chandler's job was so boring that nobody could remember what he did. What did Chandler do? Data processing. <laughs> Computer science, okay? So I don't think we, we managed to fix K-12 to until we can get the media to do something about the, the way they portray computer scientists. And you know, many of you are not old enough to remember when there were almost no female doctors or lawyers. But you know, when I was growing up, there were no female doctors or lawyers. And in the 70s, there were all these great TV shows that showed very attractive women with lives, boyfriends, children, all kinds of stuff doing things that really mattered to society, and they were doctors and lawyers. And th those TV shows are still on today. I, can I cannot tell you how many um, TV media executives I have talked to about this issue. And they will say, but nobody knows any engineers. They're boring. Nobody would be interested in seeing a show about engineers. Oh, give me a break. I mean, so, so my solution is, and, and this differs from, for instance, Jan Cooney at NSF, who's really trying hard to get a lot of much better computer science teachers into the schools. But you know, my worry is, my feeling is, that's going to take a long time to happen. We can fix it with the students entering college. If we can just get to the first year females and get them to take their first computer science course and love it, and then get them their first job using the stuff they learned, we can fix this problem much, much faster. Last question. Good. Uh, my name is Leah. I'm a software development engineer at Amazon. And I was, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about improving gender ratios in industry. Yes. So um, I don't actually know the Amazon figures. I happen to know the Google and Facebook figures, that, um, which are, and the Microsoft figures. Um, so Microsoft is roughly about 20% um, female, 21% female. Um, in, in its technical population. Google is 9.5, and Facebook, the last time I got the number, which was a year ago, was 7.5%, which was up from 2.5% three years before. So they've been working really hard on it, and, I, and I'm pretty sure it's up a fair bit uh, over the last year. So um, Jeff Wilkie happens to be a close friend of mine. And I was, um, and, and he went to Princeton, and, and I got to know him. He joined the Leadership Council, um, the School of Engineering at Princeton. And I remember having a conversation with Jeff that went roughly like this. I had met a number of fairly junior people, females at Amazon, um, at the Hopper Conference. And they had been really unhappy. And, and I said to Jeff, I met a number of junior, I didn't mention their names, but you know, I didn't say where I met them, because that might have you know, like outed them. But I just said, you know, they weren't very happy and they didn't really feel like the process was merit-based. And I sort of had the sense in talking to some people since then that it's quite a bit better and I'm, I'm not quite sure what changed. Um, one of the th uh, things, um, so um, this year one of our students who actually, a, a female CS grad who ended up going to work for Microsoft, she interviewed at four tech companies. 
She didn't meet a single female in any of the interviews, not one. Moreover, the way both tech and finance companies tend to interview is incredibly obnoxious to many young women. So you basically, you walk into the interview and the person may not even say hello, and then they'll say, I want you to know how you would program a red-black tree that did such and such. It's awful. <laughs> it's just like, uh, so, you know, I, I actually heard a good question that um, somebody from Microsoft, w they were doing, there's, there's some kind of junior intern program that they do for students in their first summer or second summer, and the question they were asking them was, tell me how you would explain Java or another object-oriented language to a five-year-old. That is a good question, okay? Because it's not stressful. It's not, it's not something you have to study for, but it really shows how you think about object-oriented languages, and it also shows what your communication skills are. And so I, I think that the first thing that needs to happen if you want to recruit more women is you need to change the interview process. The second thing is you really want to work very hard on building a community that is supportive of women in your company. And um, just as you should be doing for your undergraduate students and graduate students uh, in departments, it helps if you have some, you know, uh, so Ava Manolis is somebody that I know and have um, talked to a number of times and she's a vice president at Amazon. It really helps if you have somebody like Ava, who you actually, which I don't think Amazon does, but you know, where you actually showcase what they are doing. So for instance, so I'm trying to get Microsoft to showcase Julie Larson Green, who is, is, is really awesome. She's somebody you guys should get to come and give a talk. She's a great speaker. And you know, make it clear that women are successful. Um, just make the place supportive and welcoming and friendly. And then the, the final piece of advice that I'll give to all of you, which many of you have heard me say before, one of the most important things you can do to create a female-friendly environment is to make it okay to cry. Okay, so how do you make it okay to cry? What do you do? So somebody bursts into tears in your office, what do you do? You hand them a tissue, yeah, exactly. And you say, don't worry about crying, I cry all the time. Or you're the 27th person who cried in my office this week. <laughs> because the, the two things that are going on when a female bursts into tears, first of all, she may not be sad, she might be very angry. I often cry when I'm really angry. And, and saying, oh, I'm sorry, Maria, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, is not what I want. Um, <laughs> But I do want to do something about the snot that's about to come out of my nose. <laughs> and, and I also really want to stop feeling like a failure for having burst into tears. So if you tell me, you know, I cry all the time, or, you know, Ed Lazasco was in my office and, and burst into tears last week, or whatever. <laughs> it, just, it just moves you on past this moment. And so, you know, just doing some awareness that, um, that this is something that happens and it's okay that it happens. Um, I remember um, one of the students who graduated, I think, in my second year at MUD, and I was talking about this, and she said, I cannot tell you how much better my experience at MUD would have been if all the male faculty knew what to do when a female bursts into tears. So, Maria, thank you so much. Thank you.